Everybody has heard of the Puritan Pilgrim Fathers. In 1620, they embarked for the New World in the Mayflower. Not so many know about the Quakers some decades later, who set out likewise to make new lives for themselves in the American colonies. Even fewer people know that amongst these were several Buckinghamshire families. It's these folk I shall be talking about. I'm Anne Flood. I'm an Amersham Quaker with responsibility for ensuring present day Quaker records are properly cared for. I'm actually sitting in a part of today's meeting house in Amersham, which several of those intrepid 17th century Quakers just might have known. Whilst the Pilgrim Fathers, and most importantly the Pilgrim Mothers, mostly settled in what became Massachusetts, the Quaker families tended to gravitate further south along the eastern seaboard of North America into what was at that time described as the wilderness of the New Jerseys, especially West New Jersey. We know this from documentation flowing to and fro between Quaker meetings on either side of the Atlantic, and more especially from details contained within the Minute Book of Quaker monthly meetings held in the broad Chilterns area then known to Quakers as the Upper Side. It is these details which have intrigued me, leading to the preparation of this talk. Why did newly arriving Quakers avoid the Puritan areas already settled? This is at least partly explained by the previously quite brutal treatment earlier Quaker arrivals had received at the hands of the Puritans further north. Although they had themselves been subject to persecution back in England, these Puritan settlers now took to persecuting anybody who refused to conform to Puritan ways. Quakers seem not to have been deemed strict enough. Indeed, Quakers were banished from Massachusetts on pain of death. Several Quakers had been hanged for challenging Boston's bloody laws, including in 1660 a woman, Mary Dyer. <clears throat> the lands in North America we're talking about were, of course, still colonies of the English crown. There seems to have been quite a lively trade in proprietorships of these tracts of land. The wealthy, who invested in them and thus became proprietors, mostly remained firmly based on this side of the Atlantic. An exception to this was local Quaker William Penn, who actually inherited land just across the Delaware River from New Jersey, where he founded what became Pennsylvania. Charles II had originally granted the land to Penn's father in settlement of a debt. Back in Buckinghamshire, the Upper Side Minute Book tells us that throughout the 1670s and 1680s, a steady stream of Quakers were either preparing to embark for West New Jersey or that they had already settled and were now writing back to their home meeting to request what today we might call a reference or certificate of good character. I have attempted to identify the Quaker families involved and, where possible, to trace what became of them once arrived in West New Jersey, or indeed in adjoining areas of America. The family names I came across are Cooper, Jennings, Olive, Barton, Adams, Clark, Child and Pennington. Of great interest, too, is the name Archdale, though this gentleman's American connections were with the Carolinas rather than with the Jerseys. What kind of folk were these bold people? What did they do for a living? Were they young or older?
how did they even get to hear of potential opportunities open to them overseas at a time when communications were so basic and so much slower than today? Why did they leave? We can hazard informed guesses as regards these last two queries, at least. In 1673, George Fox, the founder of Quakerism, arrived in our area shortly after his return from his own visit to the earlier Quaker settlements in America, where he had travelled around for the best part of two years. He was staying with the newlywed William and Gullielma Penn in Rickmansworth. The lively exchanges between Fox, Penn and doubtless other local Quakers probably stimulated Penn's interest in, establishment, in establishing a settlement on Quaker principles in America and also planted the idea of a better, freer life overseas in the minds of others present. Given the persecution to which Quakers in Old England were subject at that time, the prospect of a new life, led as one wished to lead it, must have been tempting indeed. George Fox's reports of interaction with the indigenous First Peoples in America were also encouraging. Fox reported how helpful the Indians had proved. We came one night to an Indian town and lay at the king's house, who was a very pretty man. Pretty here meaning worthy. Both he and his wife received us very lovingly. On their travels, the English visitors had been guided by Indians along native trails through what Fox called that wilderness country of West New Jersey. So, definitely an improvement on treatment which might be meted out to Quakers here at home. What could happen, for instance, was the following. If a Quaker failed to put in the stipulated number of attendances at his local Anglican church services, failed to pay church rate, or to contribute his share of the local incumbent's tithe, he was fined, or subject to distraint of goods, that was the confiscation of property and or of foodstuffs supposedly equal in value to what was owed, but in practice often exceeding that amount. Furthermore, if a group of adult persons from different households, exceeding five in number, were found to have met under colour of religion in other manner than allowed by the liturgy of the Church of England, they were in contravention of the Second Conventicle Act of 1669. This meant another steep fine, of which one-third went to the king's coffers, one-third to the poor, and the remaining third to the person who had, so to speak, turned the Quakers in. Informing could thus become quite lucrative for the unscrupulous. Quaker communities rallied round and collected money and goods to alleviate the sufferings of those affected. Settling beyond the seas on land negotiated for with the indigenous population, not seized from them by force, provided an opportunity not only to escape such persecution, but to show Quakerism at work, once freed from the constraints at home in England. As to the who, it seems the first local family to follow in earlier Quakers' pioneering footsteps were the Coopers, who lived in Colesholm. Father William worked as a blacksmith in the village. They were well-established Quakers who would have worshipped down the hill from Colesholm in Old Amersham. In the 1670s, this would not have been in what is now Amersham Quaker Meeting House, from whose meeting room I am now speaking, but in various friends' houses round about, including in the cottage onto which this present meeting house was later constructed. 
To the rear of this cottage lay an orchard. The last tree from that orchard, which survived, fell, finally, in a storm only in the 1920s. An area at the far end of the slope of the grounds served as a Quaker burial ground. Coles Hill at that time was beyond the jurisdiction of Buckinghamshire magistrates, being, administratively speaking, an outlier of Hertfordshire. Quakers cannily chose to live there, surmising that Hertfordshire magistrates wouldn't put themselves to the bother of pursuing and persecuting them across the county border. William Cooper was evidently a much trusted and respected member of the Quaker community. The Upper Side Minute Book, in its records of the community's business meetings, reveals that William was frequently entrusted with inquiring into delicate issues arising within the community and giving reports on his findings. He also seems for a time to have acted as treasurer, holding the stocks of money contributed to the community by its members and dispersing from this fund in cases of hardship, as was felt necessary. The need arose quite frequently. At the meeting held on the 7th of June 1671, William was asked to pay out a total of £1, 5 shillings and 6 pence to two impoverished Quakers, with the result that there remains nothing now in William Cooper's hands. The visits William Cooper made in pursuance of his inquiries must have required a high degree of tact. They were made not just to people in debt or to couples intending to marry, but also to the disputatious. The wording of the record is that he was asked to visit and admonish them in love. <clears throat> when William and his wife Margaret, who had performed similar visiting functions for the women's business meeting, announced their intention of emigrating, the meeting provides a glowing testimonial for them to take with them to Quakers in West New Jersey. The text of it runs as follows. <clears throat> Whereas William Cooper of Colts Hill in the parish of Amersham and in the county of Hartford, blacksmith, hath signified unto us that he hath an intention, if the Lord permit, to transport himself with his wife and children unto the plantation of West New Jersey, we do hereby certify that the said William Cooper and Margaret his wife have walked conscientiously and honestly amongst us, agreeably to the profession and testimony of truth, according to the best of our knowledge and observation of them. <clears throat> this testimonial has the date in modern terms, 5th of February, 1679. So off they went, William and Margaret, and their five children. The children were aged between 18 or 19, that was William Jr, and six, that was little Daniel. What can it have been like, tossing about on the Atlantic in a fragile sailing craft in, to say the least, primitive living conditions, with nine and six-year-olds in tow? At 16, Hannah, the only girl, was probably a great support to her harassed mother on board. If we now virtually cross the Atlantic ourselves, we come across news of how the Cooper family fared once they had arrived in West New Jersey. The present day Camden County History, whose website is readily accessible, covers precisely the area where the family settled. William, of course, had his own skills to fall back on. The history record shows that he also took over the running of the ferry crossing of the Delaware River, linking West New Jersey with Philadelphia in William Penn's newly founded Pennsylvania. That was in 1688. <clears throat> that 
Six-year-old small boy Daniel certainly survived the journey since he grew up to run the same ferry from 1693. For a century thereafter, the settlement which sprang up around the ferry was known as Cooper's Ferry. Daughter Hannah married a certain John Walston in New Jersey in 1681. The other boys, Joseph and James, appear to have stayed within the New Jersey Quaker community as their names occur in the minutes of the Burlington Quaker meeting. It's not possible to be absolutely sure that it's our William Cooper who is referred to, but the death of A. William Cooper, born 1632, Hertfordshire, England, is recorded in New Jersey in 1691, and this would seem to fit. The family name also lives on elsewhere in the Camden County, not least in the form of the Cooper River, a tributary of the Delaware. The area of its confluence with the Delaware is Cooper Point to this day. The Coopers were not exactly founding fathers in the sense of the early settlers or of that other slightly younger enterprising spirit with links to Buck's William Penn. But Buck's connections do not end there. William Cooper will have been well acquainted with Samuel Jennings, an Aylesbury Quaker described in the records as salesman and in similar terms to those adopted by William Cooper in 1680, he too informed the Upper Side Meeting of his intention, if the Lord permit, to transport himself with his wife and children unto West New Jersey. <clears throat> it had been nearly ten years since Samuel Jennings and Anne Olive, both of them from Aylesbury, had expressed their intention of marrying and had married, with the meeting's approval. Perhaps even then Samuel had been thinking of undertaking the perilous business of emigration, since a condition of the approval was that Samuel should first take steps to assure Anne's grandparents that she would be properly provided for, should Samuel himself come to grief in the enterprise. By the time of the Jennings family's departure, it consisted of parents, Samuel and Anne, together with five-year-old William and one-year-old Sarah, children even younger than the Coopers had been to be embarking on the arduous voyage. They arrived safely later in 1680. A further four children were born to Samuel and Anne in America. Sadly, of these, two did not survive to, to see their 20th birthday, and neither did the eldest child, William. In 1700, however, Sarah married William Penn's step-brother-in-law, Edward Pennington, of whom more anon, but he died two years later. In 1704, Sarah married again, this time a certain Thomas Stevenson. Sarah's younger sisters, Anne and Mercy, also married Stevensons. The young colonies had achieved a degree of self-government self for all that they were still subject to the English crown. Before his departure for America, Samuel Jennings had actually been appointed to the post of Deputy Governor of West New Jersey by one of its absentee proprietors, Edward Billing. The family settled in what became the city of Burlington and in 1683 Samuel Jennings was elected Governor, partly at the instigation of William Penn but rather to the discomfiture of Billing, who felt sidelined in the process. Jennings proved a popular choice and an effective administrator. He seems to have demonstrated considerable diplomatic skills, for we read, 
The tact of Governor Jennings, who was thoroughly acceptable to the settlers, avoided open rupture and quieted the prevalent discontent. Queen Anne had acceded to the English throne by 1703 when the two Jersey provinces were united under a royal governor. During Jennings's tenure, this was the Queen's cousin, Lord Cornbury. When Jennings, as elected governor, in dealings with this august personage, stood up for the colony with typical Quaker plain speaking, Lord Cornbury was apparently heard to expostulate, Jennings has the impudence enough to face the devil! Samuel Jennings died sometime between 1706, when he resigned as Speaker of the General Assembly for the city of Burlington, and 1709, when his will was proved. In his will, he is described as merchant. He makes an interesting bequest to Thomas Elwood of the Upper Side Meeting back in Bucks. Also, I give and bequeath unto my long acquainted, worthy and dear friend Thomas Elwood of Hunger Hill, near Amersham in the county of Bucks in Great Britain, the sum of twenty pounds of sterling money to buy him a gelding, or otherwise, as he shall think fit. This might be a suitable point for an explanatory word about these testimonials or certificates being requested from the home Quaker meeting. The testimonial was a piece of paper prepared by the meeting guaranteeing to the destination Quaker community that those bearing it to them were fully sympathetic to Quaker principles and were what today we might call clean living. In other words, in a world where non-Quakers were all too ready to leap upon any apparent misdeed or lapse in a Quaker's behaviour in order to discredit the new sect, the testimonial indicated that the person, persons named in it were not likely to let the side down. Other newly professed Quakers wishing to travel and settle overseas come or send to their home meeting for a certificate to guarantee their clearness. By this is meant that any previous romantic entanglements or engagements to marry were now considered over and done with to the satisfaction of all parties. In the Upper Side Minute book, we come across the case of Joyce Olive, sister of that Anne Olive who had married Samuel Jennings. She too was originally from Aylesbury, but had moved to London, where it seems she met a young joiner from Hoban called Isaac Marriott or Marriott. At some stage, the two of them must have declared their intention of sailing to West New Jersey and marrying. For the Upper Side Minute Book's record from May 1680 notes a disgruntled Roland Foster of Wickham complaining to this meeting that Joyce Olive, formerly of Aylesbury, having for some time entertained him in the way of a suitor in order to marriage, is lately removed to London in order to transport herself beyond the seas, to his great trouble and dissatisfaction. Joyce did indeed sail to West New Jersey, but once there did the right thing and commissioned her brother Thomas, back in Aylesbury, to request for her a certificate concerning her clearness in relation to marriage. So, friend William Kidder was duly dispatched by the meeting to sort matters out with Roland Foster. He discovered that Joyce's previous attachment to Roland Foster, upon more serious thoughts through a dissatisfaction on her part, was wholly laid aside, and that Roland Foster did acquit her and leave her perfectly free.
But there was a proviso. She should not engage herself to Isaac Marriott for the space of one year. To this the meeting agreed. Eventually Joyce did marry Isaac. Out in West New Jersey they had three children. Two of these died young and Joyce herself died in September 1695. Isaac later remarried. Those certificates provide us with several more names of Bucks Quakers who made new lives in the American colonies. Such folk probably didn't hold important positions when they arrived, but simply pursued whatever trade or craft they were already skilled at. They may also have felt it their duty to move around spreading news of Quaker ways. They could all, in Quaker parlance, be ministers. Amongst them we find Thomas Barton, removed, as the Upper Side Minute Book has it, to New West Jersey in America in 1681. He was an Aylesbury man. Since the meeting is asked to provide him with a certificate concerning his clearness and orderly conversation, it looks as if he was intending to marry over there. That paper was duly signed and dispatched, and Thomas married Anne Borton in Burlington the same year. William Clark of Aylesbury was already living in West New Jersey in September 1684. He too wished to marry. This time it was Governor Samuel Jennings himself who submitted the request for a certificate. Needless to say, this was granted. And there is a record of the intended marriage to Mary Heritage in Burlington though this does not appear in that meeting's records until 1687. Then we hear of Amy Child of Chesham, formerly of Hartford, intending to go to New Jersey and in 1684 requesting and being granted a certificate of clearness. In 1686 in Burlington she married Edward Stanton. Widowed a few years later, she declared her intention of remarrying in 1689. <laughs> but it is now impossible to make out the name of her intended because that corner of the record is quite illegible. And there was also Joseph Adams of Aylesbury who desired a certificate before he set sail in 1685. In 1687, he married Mary Littlejohn in West New Jersey. There may have been others who sailed but who didn't make it, but we don't hear of them through the Upper Side Minutes. Or perhaps the Bucks locals all had particularly strong constitutions and did all survive the journey and rigours of the new life. Or again, perhaps they changed their minds about going. The Upper Side Meeting frequently entrusts the execution of tasks it, it has decided upon to one Henry Child of Coles Hill, or Amersham. He features quite prominently in the Minute Book. William Penn had returned in 1684 from overseeing the implementation of what he called his Frames for the Constitutional Government of Pennsylvania. And in May 1685, Henry Child tells the meeting he intends to move with wife and children not to West New Jersey, but to Pennsylvania, possibly influenced by this news. He requests the cust customary certificate or testimonial. However, as late as 1689, Henry Child is plainly still on this side of the Atlantic since he has been given oversight of the rebuilding of a cart house in the yard of Thomas Elwood's property, where many upper side meetings were held, so as to provide extra stabling for the horses of those attending those meetings. This sounds like the equivalent of having the car park extended today. No more is heard of Henry Child, but then the one transcribed volume of the minutes to hand 
comes to an end in 1690, so perhaps Henry set, set sail later. What is interesting in the wider historical context is that Quakers could now legally contemplate building their own premises in which to worship, and many communities did just that, Jordans and Amersham amongst them. The Toleration Act of 1689 had made it possible for nonconformists to maintain their own places of worship. The strictures and penalties of those conventical acts were no more. Other Bucks Quakers too, quite apart from William Penn, made for Pennsylvania, or for the Carolinas, north and south. Prominent among these were Edward Pennington and John Archdale. Edward Pennington was born in Amersham in 1667, the youngest son of Isaac Pennington and his wife, the former Mary Lady Springett, who was herself the mother of William Penn's first wife, Guglielma. Edward eventually settled in Pennsylvania, where he became Surveyor General. In 1700, as we have seen, he and Samuel Jennings's daughter, Sarah, declared their intention of taking each other in marriage, a state which the Burlington Meeting Minute granting approval characterises as that weighty affair. Edward Pennington died on the 11th of January, 1702, aged only about 34. Since John Archdale's American dealings were with North and South Carolina rather than with New Jersey, the area I have been concentrating on today, that intriguingly uneven character's rather lengthy tale had best be left to be told another time. In the meantime, I hope you have found it interesting to follow those old Bucks Quakers on their courageous and enterprising journeys. However, great or insignificant the mark each may have made. Thank you for joining me on their travels. <laughs>